and a good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church today. It is a joy to be here with you in God's presence as people continue to file in today. We will welcome them and be reminded that we are here together and here with God. Good morning. A few announcements. Uh, we once again are welcoming Leanne Gillespie with us. So glad to have you with us here today. Leanne, thank you for being here. Yes, indeed. Okay, party people. Maritimers Night Out, Saturday, May 13th, 5 p.m. Everybody is invited to Maritimers Night Out, going out for dinner. Uh, this month, it is at Frank Weiler's Deli. And it's my understanding, now I'm new here, uh, but Frank Weiler's Deli is different than Weiler's Deli. Is that right, or am I getting that wrong? Either way, that's right? Okay, good. Either way, make note of the address so you don't end up at the wrong deli. And then you might end up eating with some other group. But then eh, make some new friends, but who knows? But make note, uh, so May 13th, 5 p.m., Maritimers Dinner Out. Everybody is welcome. RSVP to the one and only Roger Hayes back there. Uh, we found out earlier this week uh, that uh, the Reverend Ken Tracy, former interim pastor, uh, lost his wife on April 13th. If you knew Ken at all, um, if you're still close with him, you might want to reach out, but there will be memorial services at Monte Vista Grove in Pasadena coming up. So we just thought we would announce that to everybody. And that is what's going on. Brothers and sisters, let's bring our hearts and minds together to be in God's presence. Today, sing praises to God, all you faithful ones. Where there was no way, God leads us in a new way. Where there was no mercy, God surprises us with fresh mercy. Where there was weeping, God invites us to step into a new life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us worship God. Our opening song today is I Could Sing of Your Love Forever. This is a praise and worship classic. I was telling our musicians today that next time we sing this, uh, I still remember how to play this on guitar, and I might pull out my guitar and play with this next time we sing this. So, yes. But let's all rise if you're able. Let's join together to sing. Sing of your love forever. 
Well, all right, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm going to invite you all now into a time of confession. This is a time where we turn to God, we confess our sins to God, we turn over those places where we have fallen short, and we humbly receive God's abundant mercy. So let's join together now in our prayer of confession. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you with our exhaustion and burdens, our weary faces and tired feet. We come before you beat down by the world. Renew us in your spirit. Lift us up with your steadfast love and strength. Call upon us to lean on each other, to share our burdens with each other, and to help carry each other's love. It's not an easy call to follow you, but help us hold on to your love. In the name of Christ, our rock and our redeemer, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this good news today. Christ has come into the world not to condemn us, but to set us free from the power of sin, to show us the way to new life, to redeemed life, to the fullness of life. So know today that we are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Well, friends, we are in the Easter season. Easter is not just one Sunday, but it's a whole season. We are in the Easter season, and part of the fun of the Easter season is looking at all of these passages from the Bible that come immediately after Easter, and how the people of Christ, this redeemed community, the first Christians, lived together in the knowledge of Jesus' resurrection, experiencing resurrection, this new way of life, knowing that death has lost its sting. We're going to take a look at Acts at chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. This is one of my absolute favorite passages so excited to read this to you today. Let's take a look at Acts 2, 42 through 47. Let's listen for the word of God. They, the first Christians, the first church, these early disciples, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, I want to share a story. I want to share a story today. It's kind of about culture, about relationships. This is one that blew my mind when I first heard about it. Maybe you've experienced something similar. Maybe not. A few years ago, my brother, or my my brother-in-law, my sister, came in the mail an envelope, a really nice, fancy, pretty envelope. They opened it up, and it was on very nice stationery. It came from uh, some friends, a couple. It came from a couple. You can guess what this might have been that they got in the mail, right? And they opened it up, and it says, You are on the wait list to be invited to our wedding. That is, they were officially getting notice that they were on the wait list, and if somebody RSVP'd no, then they would get actual invitation to the wedding. I heard this and I was like, what? Is this what the world is now? Where you get a conditional invitation to something? Here's the thing. The crazy part is one week before the wedding, and this was a big fancy wedding, they got a letter that said, you made it! You made it onto the guest list! 
And they said, cool, and they went to the wedding and bought a gift and everything. This is the difference between me and my sister, because if this had been me, I'd have written back a letter that said, we are no longer friends, don't ever talk to me again. I mean, this was something so new to me, a way of understanding friendship and community that I just could not get my head around. This conditional friendship, this layering of friends. You are good enough of a friend to be on the wait list. I would have preferred to just get a letter in the mail that says, I don't like you at all. Please don't come to my wedding. That's what I, I would have rather had that. But in the church, in the church community, and hospitality are at the very core of who we are and what we do. And by inviting people into our midst, we are showing the love of God. We aren't just inviting people into a building. We are inviting people into the presence of God. Community with Christ and community with each other. And the hospitality that we show each other is absolutely at the core of what we do. Now the sad thing is, though, is that far too often, when we're not at our best, and sometimes we're not at our best, we speak about all churches, the Church Universal here, when we're not at our best, we sometimes make that community conditional. Not necessarily consciously, we say, yes, everybody's welcome, but then kind of unconsciously we put up little roadblocks and signs that say, well, yes, everybody's welcome, but eh, not, not you. I mean, those people aren't actually welcome, right? Sometimes when we're at our worst, that's what we do, whether knowing it or not. And to avoid this, I want to look at how this early church in Acts 2, how they acted, how in the light of the resurrection and the good news of Easter, they started to form themselves and define themselves as God's community, as the church. Well, this passage that we just read, it comes right after this rousing sermon from Peter where 3,000 people heard and decided to follow Jesus. 3,000 people came to faith in Jesus after this sermon that Peter preached. Someday, some week, make sure you're here for that week. When I get that one out, we'll see when that, when that one happens. But with these 3,000 and all the apostles, the church is starting to build. And we, here we have this picture of what the first church was like. Well, what made this church so great? Well, it says, first, they were in awe. They were in awe, seeing all the amazing things that are happening. I'd ask, when was the last time that you were just in awe? You just had that feeling of awe. Maybe when you saw the Grand Canyon. Maybe at the birth of a child or a grandchild. Hearing an incredible guitar solo, and you're just like, yes, I'm in awe of this. They were feeling this in the presence of God, seeing the things that the apostles were doing there in the church by the power of God, and just this feeling of, whoa, this is something bigger than me, something bigger than all of us. They were seeing every day what God was doing. What's more, they were sharing everything, giving to everyone as needed. Now, just a word of warning here for those of you who grew up during McCarthyism. There's a word here that might make you shudder. They were living communally. We might even say they were living under communism? As a commune together? Certainly a holy form of communism, not a dictator sense of communism, or not like we knew it in the mid-century. But this is what they were doing. They were living communally. In the Protestant church, we don't have many examples of this, but our Catholic brothers and sisters have practiced this throughout history. In monastic communities, nuns living together, monks living together. Milson and I got to go visit a monastery once and spend a weekend with some monks, and they shared everything in this communal life together. I was watching a TV show recently where a nun was addressing the other nuns, and she says, this decision has been made, and it's above my pay grade, which is zero. I was like, yeah, because you're sharing everything, and there's no pay grade amongst the nuns. This is still practiced today. Sharing everything. They also spend a lot of time eating together and worshiping. I assume they all had jobs. They all had their regular jobs and whatnot that they went to, but their free time was devoted to being together, to praising God. Then it says, too, in all of this, the community 
had great favor for them. People were joining more and more every day. We might well, we might just kind of shrug and say, well, that's nice. I mean, that was a long time ago. This can't happen today. It was a different context, a different place. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, it is a very different time today than it was 2,000 years ago in ancient Israel, ancient Palestine. It's a different time, a different context. But the writer of Acts lays out very clearly what made this happen, what was so valuable and important here. And while we might not do it exactly as they did back then, and that's okay, we can live faithfully seeing what they did in this early church. He almost in a way, I hate to say it like this, but he almost in a way gives a formula. Verse 42, he says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayers. Follow these four easy steps, and you too will be in awe of God's presence. Maybe so. But what were these four things that they were doing? Step one, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were eager to learn. If you want to act like Jesus, you've got to learn how Jesus lived, what he said, how he acted, how he did things. How do we act like Jesus today? How do we learn about this? Well, we make opportunities for Christian education. We take ownership over our own education. We pursue it. We own it. We also know that knowing is not the totality of faith. It's not just about knowing faith. I could know everything there is to know about how swimming works and how, how to swim and then get in a pool and not be able to swim at all. You've got to do it. It's not just the knowing. Step two, they devoted themselves to fellowship. Getting together. Being together. I'll tell you, when I used to work as a youth pastor, one of my absolute favorite things was seeing Facebook pictures of the kids in youth group getting together and sharing time with the other kids in youth group outside of the church. And seeing that, oh, these kids who met each other in church got together at school, they got together in other ways, this fellowship was growing. We have so many opportunities for fellowship here, spending time together, even just that casual time together. But being in fellowship, it isn't just about hanging out, it's being together in a Christ-like way. It's the peace of Christ coming into your relationships, informing them, making them strong. I remember experiencing this as a teenager in a somewhat simple but very profound way. I used to hang out with my friends at school, spend lots of time hanging out with friends at school. But when we'd hang out together, as teenagers often are, it was very sarcastic, very mean, lots of putting each other down, right, as teenagers can do. But then when I went and hung out with people at church, it wasn't that. There was encouragement. There was kindness. There was a desire to see each other do well. And it was such a stark difference from the hanging out with people at school. And it was because it was fellowship. It was time together, lifted up and made possible by the love of Christ. And it radically changes how we get together. That's fellowship. That's what they were doing in the early church. Step three, they devoted themselves to breaking bread. Eating together in every culture around the world is a significant event. When people eat together in the name of Christ, God is there. You'll notice if you ever call me up to schedule a meeting, my go-to is always a lunch meeting. I'll say, yeah, let's go get lunch. Let's go find one of the thousands of great restaurants we've got around here. Let's go eat lunch together. It's so much more fun to eat together. And also, of course, this alludes to communion. Every month we celebrate communion here, this ritualized, symbolic form of eating together. Eating with all of our family of Christ, eating together in communion with all brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. We remember, too, that Celebrating communion together is not just a personal thing, but a community thing. And eating with each other and eating with people you might not ever get to have lunch together with. But here, in Christ's presence, eating together. And finally, step four, they devoted themselves to prayers. This kind of says that. They devoted themselves to prayers. 
Now, this might mean a specific liturgy, like an order of worship that they had that they went through. But it also means just prayer in general. They were devoted to praying together, praying for one another, being together, and lifting their voices to God. So as if we said before in here, prayer is such a radical act. It means that even in this seemingly flattened and limited world, there is a God that transcends it all and knows us and cares about us. Think again about how radical that is. To see that there's something more than just the stuff around us. Prayer is the lifeblood of discipleship and is such a vital part of community. Knowing that someone is praying for you, showing that deep care, that sense of being made and known, just that feeling of love when someone comes up to you and says, hey, can I pray for you? What's going on? I want to pray for you. There's so much more that could be said here about the early church. I just love the early, early church and what was going on there. But it can all be summed up, I think, in one word. Hospitality. Or better yet, how about two words? Holy hospitality. The ways that we organize our lives and our church so that people can come and feel welcomed. And continuing to ask ourselves, how can we do that even better? Even when we're doing it really well, how can we do it even better? I tell you, I've shared this with uh, the, the elders, and maybe some of you too, but one of the absolute most formative moments uh, in, my, uh, in, in, in leadership and being a pastor, I was a, a, an intern at First Presbyterian Church of Cranford, New Jersey, working with a pastor named Greg. I was 24 years old, and he was spending all of this time getting together money and talking to contractors to build a wheelchair ramp into the sanctuary. So there were a lot of steps outside, and he wanted to uh, make sure that the sanctuary was completely wheelchair accessible. And he was spending so much time on this, and uh, like he was missing meetings and stuff, and I, uh, meetings we were supposed to have together, to meet with people, to build this wheelchair ramp. And finally I said to him, I said, Greg, why are you spending so much time on building a wheelchair ramp when we don't even have anybody in our church who's in a wheelchair? And he said, exactly. That's exactly why I'm spending so much time getting a wheelchair ramp, is because we don't have anybody in our church in a wheelchair, because they can't get into our sanctuary, and we are failing in hospitality in that regards. It was one of those like mind-blown moments. Oh, of course, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We always have to be examining ourselves and seeing if we're putting up invisible signs or signs that says, yes, you are welcome upon this condition. You are invited conditionally. Examining ourselves and saying, no, how can we be more radically inclusive in our hospitality? Getting away with those conditions. I'm so excited for the future of this church and how God will multiply and grow the great things that are being done here, but the excitement for hospitality and welcoming people here it makes for this to be a powerful place to be. But just like those early Christians devoting ourselves to prayers, to gathering together, to eating together, to sharing life together, we welcome God into those relationships, and we welcome new people to come and join in the fellowship with God. Let's go to God with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you that there was a time when someone opened the door to each and every one of us and said, we want you to come in here, to know who God is, to know who Jesus is. Help us, Lord, like those early disciples, to open up those doors to show that radical love and hospitality so that someone else can know your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
song. Let's take joy uh, and sing together. If you're able, please rise as we sing together. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountain and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will come. 